Welcome to the woods. I'm David Gregg, the director of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey and leader of our state's BioBlitz. Each year, at a carefully chosen location, BioBlitz participants from all walks of life, from inquisitive school kids to seasoned scientists, team up for 24 hours and comb the landscape for plants, fungi, birds, mammals, reptiles, all forms of life. Within those 24 hours, a lot happens. Being alone in nature was one of my most gratifying experiences growing up. It was my retreat, my kingdom, my teacher. The woods were a place I could master with knowledge, identifying the animals, discovering what made them different from each other, what made them similar, figuring out how animals and plants lived and how they connected, how they worked together. I quickly learned that I was part of the equation. My actions caused reactions that caused other actions and on and on. For years, I used that same butterfly net made from a broken hockey stick and a scrap of stiff wire. All my techniques for searching, netting, and handling were completely self-taught. I was a self-made naturalist. I wondered if there were others out there like me. And that's when I happened to cross BioBlitz. It was a 24-hour whirlwind dedicated to finding critters and identifying them. I fit in instantly. I had found my tribe. My job is to organize this event, but I'm also your host, here to explain what's going on. It's time for working scientists to practice their craft, perhaps add to a specimen collection or generate data on a rare species. For newcomers, it's a chance to explore while learning the science firsthand from seasoned volunteers. BioBlitz was dreamed up by E.O. Wilson and other scientists from Harvard and the USGS and the National Park Service. As the first event of its kind, it was dedicated to demonstrating the biodiversity all around us. Even the worst looking land has lots of things to see. No place is a throwaway. The BioBlitz idea caught fire. People everywhere began to realize they could find intricate and diverse ecosystems right in their own backyard. Events are now held annually all over the country and around the globe. We survey a different in-state location each year, and this time, our teams are going to Rhode Island's southern coast, along the narrow river between Middle Bridge and the Atlantic Ocean, right in the midst of Canonchet Farm, now a park and museum, but once used for agriculture. We split up into teams according to the organisms, either plants or animals, that can be grouped together, the moss team, the mammal team, and so forth. Each team has a leader or captain that reports team findings to Science Central, our BioBlitz headquarters. And it's an opportunity to provide a snapshot of the health of the site, which also allows us to provide conservation management advice to the property's owners. The data we collect also go into a statewide repository, adding to the environmental information already on record. Our other goal is to provide an opportunity for people, especially kids, to learn about scientific field work. This is a chance for one generation to mentor another, so the next generation of ecologists, lawyers, accountants, writers, plumbers, artists, and farmers are inspired to take notice of their place in the environment. So come on, let's kick this thing off. Hello, hello. This is the official start of BioBlitz. Let's go out there and get what we can. Thanks to that makeshift gong, BioBlitz is officially underway. Teams are dispersing from Science Central and traveling to their pre-selected habitats to begin their searches. Let's follow the fish team down to the salty place where the river mixes with the sea. Okay, so who's, who's been seining before? This is Chris Littlefield. He works for the Nature Conservancy on Block Island and runs its Marine Projects Division. Saining is a netting method often used in shallow waters when trying to gather a large sample of what lives beneath the surface. All right, and they just start walking up on the beach there toward Ross. Keep the, keep the stick down. 
As netters walk along the shore, fish, crabs, and other critters are herded into the net. We have our first sample species. Oh, oh, oh we, got, we got a nice big green crab, yeah? Okay, get the bucket. Once, once we get the bucket, I don't want him to get away. Get him from behind. Come on, just hit me. <laughs> Lots of crabs. It's a killifish? Uh, oh, it's, it's striped. <laughs> if you hold her, yeah, if you hold hermit crabs upside down, watch this. Watch, he's gonna come out. Because they can, they can sense gravity. Uh, sometimes it will crawl all the way out because they don't like they don't like being upside down. Yeah, let the fish go. Someone forgot it. Oh, there's a limpet on it. It's a limpet. Yeah, slipper shell. So you got green crabs that are green and green crabs that are orange. You know right. What that is? Oh. This one's got eggs. And here's the difference between the male and the female. See? Okay, this is a winter flounder, everybody. And they're in, they're in rather severe decline. That's a good, that's a really good sign. The flounder? Yeah. Don't bring it too up. Little um, alewife. Oh, really? Oh yeah, they're very shiny. The fish team will make notes and identify these critters out here. Alewives are considered the field mice of the sea and return to coastal rivers to breed, much like salmon. To have them present represents a great food source for other animals like osprey, shorebirds, and larger predatory fish, laying a solid foundation for the entire habitat. Time to go small. Meet Fred Leader, bee enthusiast. This way. Uh, we're looking for bees, wild bees, actually, as opposed to what most people think of as bees is honeybees but we're looking for wild bees. Oh, this is strictly a hobby. Uh, I grew up in Situ, I've been on Block Island for 30 years. They had the bio blitz on Block Island four years ago, and uh, I said, what the heck, I've always been interested in science. I'm kind of known on Block Island as the bee guy. Honeybees are pollinators. It's all about pollination. Um, it's been observed that uh, about one of every three bites of food you take is dependent on a pollinator. The native bees are, do just as good a job. There's a, one called the blue orchard bee. 250 of them will do the pollination work of two colonies of honeybees. They're just that efficient. Maybe I did. Maybe I did miss. Gardens are great for attracting bees, but uh, kind of tough for collecting because you don't want to mangle the flowers too much. <laughs> this is one most people know because this is one of your carpenter bees, which you've been seeing a lot of lately. These are the ones that will be flying around your house looking to uh, chew holes in your siding. Is there anything else I can get without destroying the flowers? You've probably heard on the news that bee populations are dying off worldwide. These pollinators are critical to food production. Fred's assessment of localized species is an important contribution to the big picture of bee health. Of course, there are other ways of capturing tiny specimens, and some don't even require a net or sample jar, just a camera with a really sweet macro setup. My name is Dan Toms. I'm from Westport, Massachusetts. So I've been doing this for about four or five years now. And I specialize in macro photography for bugs. I specialize on springtails, leafhoppers, the real tiny things that you normally wouldn't take without some serious macro lens. So what I found here is a uh, very small jumping spider. And the things I like about jumping spiders is that they have very good vision. So when you take a picture of them, they actually look at you and pose almost. Uh, leaf hoppers are one of my favorites, but they're also one of the more challenging because right when you get there, they snap and go away. <laughs> so 
So this is a winged ant. This is going to be one of the uh, fertile males that's ready to leave the nest and uh, hopefully pollinate and or spread into another nest. So as you can see, the, the wings on it indicates that it's a male. It's funny because you can see so much more through the lens. I actually saw it lift up its head and catch a bug. Let me zoom in a bit. Really nice. You can see the, the netting and the wings. Let's get a good look at some of Dan's findings. Incredible when you see them up close. A lot of times the things I find aren't ones that are normally found at the event. So I feel like I'm really helping out and uh, given a few extra species that normally wouldn't be discovered by anyone. Around here, animals aren't the only wild thing. So is the weather. Really raining now. <laughs> it seems like these shorebirds don't mind though, so I don't mind. Don't care if you come back dripping wet oh. into the science center. All they, all they care is that you have some cool specimens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who wants to carry some stuff? <laughs> this year, Wendy Finn, wildlife biologist, is leading our mammal team including many eager young scientists. So we're gonna go search for a stream, and what we're looking for is a northern shrew. It's a really rare mammal in Rhode Island. Do you guys know what a shrew looks like? You know? Yep, they got that long nose, and they got you know, the little feet. The northern shrew is typically a little bit bigger than some of the other shrews, and the really neat characteristic about it is it can run across water. Little Neck Pond is where we're gonna head. So we'll use both sides of that. The northern short-tailed shrew, like all critters, plays an important role in the ecosystem in terms of the animals it eats and the animals that eat it. Buffer up the dirt around the edges. That's perfect. Thank you. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the fencing up and we're going to have it go a little bit into the water so we can cover this gap here and make sure he can't get around that. You always want to use natural features to help you you know, when you're trapping for mammals. Mammals are really hard to trap. So you put a lot of effort in and you don't always get a lot of reward. And that's a big part of science. But when you get the reward, it's fantastic. That looks really good. As Wendy said, the trapping game is largely hit or miss, especially with just 24 hours to survey the property. Jazz Sussman Moss, a citizen scientist is determining where to place the traps. The only problem with right here is see this bump. The mice aren't going to want to jump this. I think we're going to angle it out from in here a bit more. We might want to just kind of cover it over some leaves and stuff so they'll, they'll want to go in. We have some tape here so tomorrow when we collect all the traps, we know where each one is. So it would be very terrible if we left a trap somewhere and it, the animal who got caught and it died. Traps baited and set. Now we wait. <laughs> Once we've collected all these specimens, or taken pictures, we bring it all back to headquarters, humming with energy, Science Central, for identification and cataloging. Dinner is served in the middle of ongoing work. No wasting time here. For mosses, a lot of it is, is leaf shape, uh, overall structure, it's growth form. Like if you look at this one here, it has a very upright growth form. Um, this, is the, this is the moss, Clymacium dendroides, common name for this, tree moss, because it looks like a little tiny tree. Okay, so basically what I have is I have um, some earthworms that are in Epsom salt. Um, I'm then going to be uh, moving them over to uh, ethanol to euthanize them. That allows me to look at their uh, features better so I can better identify them since uh, we got a multiple different species here. We found a lot of snails. snails. Yeah. We found yeah, I heard like, that. this is Fred. Silky parchment. That's what Gary calls it. Just like anything else. Certain things fit, certain things don't. It has this, this, and this. It doesn't have this, this, and this. It's growing in a certain area, certain time of year. A lot of people want to eat them, so you got to be careful. Careful observation is needed for this type of sorting. Some teams have spent the entire time looking through one scoop of leaf litter collected from the forest floor. Crazy to think, but there could be more diversity in that one scoop than in a space the size of a football field. 
Why search for such minuscule critters? Because all species are important, all contributing something to the world we share. The rain and wind have picked up, and we're experiencing some flooding. Time to call off the search and head back to Science Central. We'll have daylight back before we know it. Champions, huh? Day two, early morning. Finally, it looks like the worst of the weather has passed. We are more than halfway through the 24 hours and need to keep moving to make up for hours lost to the storm. Plenty of coffee, breakfast snacks, and fresh fruit fuel our teams. Most have either worked through the night or gotten very little sleep. Some haven't even taken off their rain gear. Spirits are running high and the drive to up the species tally keeps everyone motivated. Lou Parati, our reptile team leader, is already hot on the trail with a herd of excited scientists in training. There we go. Oh, a little garden snake. How about right that? Right there. Right there. Eastern garter snake? They're so awesome. Very common snake. You know, I grew up living my dream of snakes through National Geographic. But I remember, I, you know, I was uh, fourth grade. We moved out to the country, West Greenwich, and I was playing a game of hide and go seek with my newfound friends. And I was crouched behind this rock. And, you know, suddenly I get that feeling like I wasn't alone anymore. And I looked down and there coiled in the sun was a garter snake and first wild snake I had ever seen in my life. And I was like, huh. I, I just had to have that snake. I just, I just grabbed it, didn't know what it was at that time. I just picked that thing up. I just thought it was the most beautiful, amazing creature I'd ever seen in my life. Okay, the common snapping turtle, female. I'm just coming back to the pond after laying eggs. Um, as you can see, these guys can viciously defend themselves with a yeah. bite. Um, you can see she's all covered in dirt here, which, oh, yeah. where she was buried in to, to lay her eggs. I'm leading the kind of reptile and amphibian team, which is usually a popular team because everybody likes the creepy crawly things. But um, you know, the kids get a lot out of it because they're learning something that they would have never had the experience to do otherwise without an event like this. So we could take these guys out and you know give them our expertise that we've you know, have gained over years and years and years. And those kids will never forget that. Uh, it's something that they'll remember forever. Lou is right. BioBlitz creates a space where kids can see that nature is not some weird, flat, abstract thing in a book. That it's all around them, right in their own backyards. What's important is to break down the fear of nature, the unknowns, and demonstrate that it's eye-opening to explore to roll over that log, pick stuff up and check it out. This is how we all learn, professionals included. And sometimes that learning takes place in challenging classrooms. Our bird team started BioBlitz in less than ideal conditions. Yeah, the rocks are kind of slippery. Careful. Tropical storm Andrea could impact the numbers of birds we see and hear today for sure. It's not the best weather at all for songbirds. Uh, for wading birds, for the water birds and the shore birds, it's fine. Once in a while with a storm coming through, we might get something rare yeah. um, blow in, so we might get something that we haven't counted before. The great cormorants will overwinter here. The double course crested cormorants breed here. They come, come back for the breeding season. This is my fifth violet, so I've been coming since 2009. And I picked up in 2010 when we were on Block Island, and fell in love with it and have been coming ever since. You know, every year I look forward to this as, you know, the big cookout when I get together with all my friends and, you know, we geek out over a common hobby for 24 hours. Barn swallow, barn swallow. Forage and osprey. Oh, the osprey's still foraging. It's still hovering, huh? Yep. King, Belted kingfishers will do that too. They'll just hover right over the water. On day two, as the weather improved, 
So did the species count. Yeah, that's the catbird. The catbird hanging in there. He's drying out. Yeah, the cat. He's just, he's a curious little fellow. Oh, there he goes. There you go. You hear someone? You see someone? Up in the corner of the street. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What are those? That's cedar waxwing. Cedar yep. waxwing. So we have a cedar. Good job. Good for help. Yeah. So the, <laughs> yeah, there's a cedar waxwing right there. Um, I can lend you my binoculars so you can see them. They're really beautiful. Whoa, they're small in the water. All right, we got some stuff perched out there. You can scope those. Professionally, I'm a biological technician for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. You know, sometimes I'm not necessarily at the location and time that I want to be at because I have somewhere to survey, but I'm still looking at birds. While the birders continue to look and listen, let's shift gears and see what the moss team's up to. So what I would say is focus on things that are different. So These folks have patience. Of All of their specimens could very well be found within one square foot of forest floor or growing on the side of a tree. So we've got a couple of different mosses here that you notice these ones here are growing really close to the surface and these are standing out mm -hmm. from it. This one here is Eulota crispa. And this one up here I believe is um, um, Hypnum palescens. The little yellowish uh, structures there, those are the sporophytes. Much like detectives working a crime scene looking for clues, the team, or Moss CSI, knows that mosses tell us a story about the habitat where they're found. There are moss species sensitive to air pollution. Their presence means clean air, a great sign. It produces the sporophyte at the tip mm -hmm. of the stem, mm -hmm. and then the uh, hypnum palescence is more of a pleurocarp where it grows, mm -hmm. and then the sporophyte comes out on a side branch. The mammal team is quickly making its rounds, checking traps that were left overnight with the hopes of catching some nocturnal visitors. With four inches of wind-driven rain added to the mix, this may be a bit of a wild goose chase. This one hasn't shot yet. Nothing in this one. We got something. What, do what is it? It looks like it's a white-footed mouse. He was happy to come in and ha take our peanut butter bait, so we were successful. Well, this doesn't look like the hoped-for northern shrew, but it's definitely some sort of rodent. Time to get out the Bible of bioblitzers, the field guide. Woodland jumping mouse has a brownish back and orange sides with scattered dark hairs, white underparts, and a long tail with a white tip. How's the tip of that tail look, Keith? Not white. Not white. Not white. Every species counts and adds to what this location is telling us about the ecosystem's health. We are now in the final hour of BioBlitz, and teams work to gather their last bits of data. It's all hands on deck. See the triangular green green King of the mullets. <laughs> you got a seat, Robin. Would you look this one up for me? Can you do that? Yeah, the nematodes. Yeah. yeah. Nematodes? Yep, those are nematodes. These are all the light traps that were set last night, and I guess it just let up enough long enough early this morning before daylight and actually had a decent night. Five, four, three, two, one. Attention, attention. All right. Hello, 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 everybody, all you BioBlitzers. This has been a great BioBlitz, and it's pretty darn good in numbers, too. Uh, vascular plants was 323. But mosses was 53 and algae 78. So all plants together is 455. Fungi 92. And that is a that is a bioblitz record by almost a factor of two. That's a really uh, good number. Despite a deluge that dumped nearly five inches of rain, job well done. The final tally shows that in 24 hours, 210 people identified a grand total of 1,265 species. A few weeks after the bio blitz ended, I spent time going through the species that were found, building a picture of what the landscape is trying to tell us. From there, the Rhode Island Natural History Survey 
was able to provide guidance for conservation management of the property. These data will help to improve the habitat for rare or endangered species, as well as assist in monitoring or removing invasives, the stuff that doesn't belong. All of the data collected will live on in an environmental data center where it can be accessed for study. This long-term record is absolutely critical for monitoring changes in the environment and will aid in research for decades. These are great accomplishments that would take years to complete if not for events like BioBlitz, where disciplines and people intersect. But perhaps the most important accomplishments in those 24 hours were the memories created, the passions ignited, and the mentoring provided. It's been an awesome experience, as it always is. Not just the act of it, trying to find different things and categorize them, but um, the camaraderie of the people around and the knowledge base that's here. It doesn't matter what you look like here. It doesn't matter how you dress here. It just matters what you're doing. It kind of changes the way you see everything. You know, that's, that's kind of what I like about it. Everybody's so friendly, so if you walk up to somebody in the insect group, they're you know, more than happy to share their information with you. It's an awesome opportunity to connect with the community, to share my passion and love of birds with you know, citizen scientists, with, uh, with the youth. I think the thing that will stick the longest is the torrential downpours. I got to a point where I was soaked to the bone and I didn't really notice when I got more wet, so I just jumped in all the puddles. I think what makes this so exciting is there are so many people here that are interested in so many different things, and when you put it all together, it's like, wow. Whether you are hiking in the middle of a vast wilderness, playing with a pet in the backyard, or sitting at a bus stop next to a vacant lot, nature is there and is always trying to tell us something. All we have to do is listen. Mm -hmm.